lying dormant within wood. In the same way, O oh Lord, those expert in understanding, the absolute truth, try to see you in everything, even in their own bodies. Yet you remain concealed. You are not to be understood by indirect processes involving mental or physical activities. Because you are self-manifested, only when you see that a person is wholeheartedly engaged in searching for you, do you reveal yourself. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Therefore, by Srila the word Kriyartai means by performing ritualistic ceremonies to satisfy the demigods. The word Vipashtita is explained in Taitari Upanishad as follows Satyam, Yanam, Anantam, Brahma, Yoveda, Nihitam, Kriyayam, Parame, Yomam. So sute sarvam kaman sahabramana vipas chitate. As Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita 7.19, Bahunam Janamanam Ante Janavam Madhupanyante, after many births and deaths, he who is actually in knowledge understands me. When one understands that the Lord is situated in everyone's heart and actually sees the Lord present everywhere, he has perfect knowledge. The word jata vedaha means fire which is produced by rubbing wood. In Vedic times, learned sages could bring forth fire from wood. Jata vedaha also indicates the fire in the stomach which digests everything we eat and which produces an appetite. The word buddha is explained in the Svetashvara Upanishad. Eko deva sarva bhuteshu buddhaha. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is understood by chanting the Vedic mantras Sarva Vyabi Sarva Bhutana Tair Atma. He is all pervading and he is within the heart of the living entities. Karma Dyakshaha Sarva Bhuta Diva Shaha. He witnesses all activities in the living entity. Sakshat Chaita Kavalo Nirgunascha. The Supreme Lord is a witness as well as the living force. Yet he is transcendental to all material qualities. Translation again by Srila Prabhupada. By manipulating a fire generating stick, great sages and saints can bring forth a fire dormant lying within wood. In the same way, O Lord, those expert in understanding the absolute truth try to see you in everything, even in their own bodies. Yet you remain concealed. You are not to be understood by indirect processes involving mental or physical activities. Because you are self manifested, only when you see that a person is wholeheartedly engaged in searching for you, do you reveal yourself. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. One of the Sanskrit phrases Prabhupada uses in, in uh, one of his purports, and it's not used very often, it's, it's actually a, a phrase that's not given any attribution in Vedic literature, it's Baba Gravi Janardana. And as far as I remember, it means seeing only the devotional qualities in everyone, or in other words, seeing the good in everyone. Actually, in one sense, everyone is Krishna consciousness, is Krishna conscious, even though they don't know it. It's said in the uh, uh, um, Chaitanya Chaitamata, I think it's in the Majalila 8th chapter. It just said a Krishna famous Sajikabunai, Shravanadi, Shri Chaitanya Kadi, Udai. And it means that love of, pure love of Krishna is uh, existing within the hearts of all living entities. In other words, everyone, in a sense, is Krishna conscious. Once Prabhupada was asked how many disciples he had, by, or I think it was a report of it, and Prabhupada's answer was unlimited. So how can that be out of the, you know, the seven billion people or so in the world? How can it be 
that uh, Prabhupada had unlimited disciples. So in this sense, Ninja Siddha Krishna Prima Sadi Kabunai Shravanani Shri Chitta Kadiyavada. Everyone is Krishna conscious. In one letter that uh, I wrote to Prabhupada asking about where he came from, he said that when one is a Siddha, it really doesn't matter whether one is Ninja Siddha, Kripa Siddha, or Sadhana Siddha. Sadhana Siddha being a perfect person by virtue of practicing Krishna consciousness or practicing the, the uh, rituals and regulations of Krishna consciousness. Kripa Siddha, by the mercy of the spiritual master or Krishna himself, and uh, Nitya Siddha being eternally liberated from birth. And in that letter, Prabhupada said that there was never a time when I did not remember Krishna. So in that sense, we could say that the Prabhupada was a, a Nitya Siddha. But when people ask him that question, I think we were talking about this the other day, uh, Prabhupada was pretty evasive. He never said directly where he came from. All the different people have different ideas where, where he originated. But in that sense, and he used the metaphor in that letter of different rivers flowing to the sea, that all rivers flow into the sea, and we don't try to find out which rivers they were, because it's all seawater, whether they're, they're coming from this river or that river, the Nile, the Amazon, the Ganga, or the Ganga, the Brahmaputra, or whatever. So in that sense, whether one is Nitya Siddha, Sadhana Siddha, Nitya Siddha, Kripa Siddha, it doesn't really matter because one is a, is a Siddha, means perfect person. One is a perfect person. So that verse exists, that everyone in one sense is Krishna conscious, and therefore we approach everyone in this Kali Yuga, even people who seem to be very, have very demonic qualities, we're approaching them constantly. And in the early days, Prabhupada was, was promoting the idea of restaurants, meaning that very small or baby steps could be very important as, as big giant steps, becoming, entering into a temple and shaving up the next day and becoming a goti almost instantaneously. That was a giant step. But a baby step, if someone comes to, say, for example, a temple for 10 or 20 years and then finally decides to become a devotee, become an initiated devotee, that that would be all right as well. So it wasn't that, that someone had to immediately surrender completely to Krishna, but if it took place over a long period of time, that was okay too. And in this, in this uh, purport, it's, it said that Krishna is not readily visible to everyone. Um, and, and Prabhupada quotes the verse, Bahunam Dhamanam Ante Ante Gyanam Mam Prabhupada After many births and deaths, he who actually is not and surrenders unto me. This means that it doesn't happen for a long time, and also that Krishna is not readily available. And he also says that, that uh, Krishna is not, oh, I think it's in the, uh, yeah, it's in the verse. Because you are self-manifested only when you see that a person is holy, engaged in searching for you, do you reveal yourself. You are not to be understood by indirect processes involving physical activities. You are everything, even in your own bodies, yet you remain concealed. So this idea that Krishna remains concealed is not a new idea. It's, it's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says that he is un, I am unmanifest to those who are, are not devotees. And in the Isha Upanishad, he asks Krishna to remove the glaring effulgence in front of the personality of Krishna. In the Isha Upanishad, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said also in the eighth chapter of the first canto, Evam Jivanikachanam, the one cannot easily see Krishna, that Krishna surrounds himself by a veil and he's only available to those devotees who are eagerly seeking him and not to all, all the others. So he's not so easily found and therefore it is not so easy to become Krishna conscious because it's, Krishna is not readily available, not easily available for everyone. It requires a lot of energy, a lot of, a, a lot of endeavor. One of the things that, that, that Prabhupada taught us was the principle of yukta vairagya. And sometimes that's used in the wrong way. Sometimes people think that um, it's just going to restaurants or playing rock music in, 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 the, in the name of Krishna, with Krishna's name uh, on their tongues, is, is a valuable thing. But sometimes that's misused. And uh, so in a way, technology can be a, a curse. It can uh, delude one from Krishna consciousness. There was a time when the boys were practicing something called the road show. I think it was in 1971 or 72. There was something called the road show. 
And it was a very popular thing, and, and Prabhupada saw the, the uh, slides of this, this uh, thing called the Road Show, and it was almost made into a, a, a Broadway in New York, Broadway musical, because it was very interesting. Birds were singing, they were chanting, and they were, they were performing dramas. And Prabhupada saw the slides, I was there, and it was very interesting. But the next day, several of them started playing with guitars and, and, uh, and drums, the trap drums, sort of, you know, regular rock, rock and roll type of drums. And uh, it became sort of a, a, a fashion, an obsession almost, with a lot of devotees that they, they thought, oh, Papa, I like the road show, we can, we can play rock and roll music, we can, we can imitate this, this thing. So there, then the pendulum kind of swung back the other way, and, and Prabhupada said that this is not proper, that we should be playing these kinds of drums in, in the temple compound, that we should be playing guitars. And he said that in the temple, only, only kartals and murdanga will be allowed. And then later on, he, he conceded to, to let the harmonium be played. But, but people had abused the principle of yukta vairagya, even though Prabhupada himself used it. Books like these were produced with computers and very modern technology, and, and, and so in Prabhupada used technology and used the principle of Yukta Vairagya himself. But again, again, he warned us that we have to be very careful because in using this process of Yukta Vairagya, we, we can be misled or we can mislead others. It's very easy to, to uh, fall prey to Maya by using this. So Prabhupada, in one sense, was very liberal, but in another way, he was very conservative. In, in many lectures, he quoted Chanakya Pandit, it's interesting to note that Chanakya wasn't even a Vaishnava, at least in pictures I've seen this kind of a sort of a shy back tea lock with three, three strands going in a horizontal fashion, which means he wasn't a Vaishnava, but he's quoted, and, and Prabhupada even memorized several of his uh, verses that were in Sanskrit. Um, one of them that I remember was that, that, uh, that all, that, that the, that even a very, that the, uh, the essence of education is that a, that a male human being should see all females as his mother. All, he should see all others' possessions as garbage in the street. And he should see all others as himself. So this was a, a, a very insightful way for a non-Vaishnava to cite what real education was. And Prabhupada valued education. Obviously, he valued it very much. He was translating very late into the night, every day, almost every day, books like these. So he valued the, the education, even if people, even if they weren't Vaishnavas, he, he valued the idea of studying. And at one point he said that we, when we give classes, we should give classes from the purports that he writes, and he said once that there were his devotional ecstasies and there would be the law books for the future of mankind. And at one point he said that we should cram the purports. And, and that's a, a form of, of the word cram, I don't know if we use it here, but we use it in America a lot for studying, for, for memorizing and, and getting ready for exams and tests in universities and schools, the word cram. So he said that we should cram his purports. In other words, he liked studying and he, he uh, gave these different degrees that we should have by Bhakti, uh, Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Bhai Baba, and Bhakti Sarva Bhuma. I don't know if it's ever been implemented, but he, he implemented it. When I was in England, we had a Bhakti Shastri test. It was a very simple test, but he wanted to get the process rolling. So the Bhakti Shastri test consisted of something like 10 questions. The first one was, who is Krishna? And there were sort of essay questions, and everyone passed, and everyone got, the, got high marks on the exams. And there were certificates issued for everyone who was a Bhakti Shastri. Uh, Jamuna made the certificates and they, they, they had a golden seal with, with red ribbons hanging down from them and everyone thought they were a very valuable thing. So it seems that the whole the idea of educating uh, was very important even from, from the early days. That was back in, in uh, 1969. And I think it hasn't really, I mean, people do, do take Bhakti. I think Bhakti Shastri is available electronically now, isn't it? But it's a very complicated thing, and it's not very standardized, and I don't know about Bhakti Sarva Bhuma and Bhakti Bhai Baba, those exams, but that, that was a very valuable and very important thing to Prabhupada. So in one sense, the, the Krishna Consciousness Movement is very, very um, conservative, but in another sense it's very, very liberal. It's liberal in the sense that we, we do a lot of networking, we have sometimes conferences with non-Vaishnavas, with Christians, with Muslims, and so on. And it's also very strict and very uncompromising in that, that uh, you know, we, 
we think of the Supreme Lord as a person, as the person Krishna. And, and it's written in the Bhagavad Gita and in other places throughout Vedic literature that, that we can't easily find Krishna. That Krishna can only be, be found by people who are, are very, very uh, eager to see Krishna or to hear about Krishna or to know Krishna. Very, very, and Prabhupada himself was very uncompromising in his lectures. He said that, that uh, you know, we're not after adoration, cheap adoration from the public or words to that effect, but we're after, we, we're after Krishna. That's the most important thing. And if we're, if we're too concerned about what people think about us, that's not a good thing. We should be in, in trying to observe what, what Krishna wants and trying to observe what Krishna wants. So I think I'm going to stop speaking here and, and see if anyone else wants to say anything. I don't know what the, the timing is like or how, how long we have. Yes, Rupa? Maharaj, um, you were saying that um, Prabhupada made that statement that uh, everyone is his disciple. Mm -hmm. It was one of the uh, Prabhupada remembrances of Makanla. I think he's a Swami. I'm not sure what his name is, but he was saying, um, that uh, Prabhupada said that, and then he said, uh, some, accept, some accept it and some don't. Mm, that's probably, probably true. I heard that Prabhupada said that they don't know, but they don't know. And I think the devotee's name was Rakan Law. And, and uh, yeah, he's very, very well known. His brother is or was, is Naran Narayan. Very, very American. But it's interesting that, that in, in a sense that, that everyone is Krishna conscious and that Krishna is within the heart. He's in the, as the super soul, of course, he's within everyone. And this is a very important verse, Nitya Siddha Krishna, uh, uh, Nitya Krishna Prima Sajja Kavanai Shravanati Shuddha Chitta Kare Evodai, because it, it, it indicates that, that everyone and anyone can be devotee of Krishna. I often tell people that the, the person who delivers the mail, the most unlikely person, could be your child's guru. We don't know. So in that sense, we have to approach everyone. And because Krishna is in the heart of every living being, and, and by the process of, uh, part of this verse says, by the process of chanting Hare Krishna, the, the Krishna consciousness can be awakened. And, and there's the saying that there's a small spark and it has to be fanned into a big, into a big fire. It has to be made Krishna conscious. So there's that little spark in every living entity, whether human or, or an animal or anyone. And it just has to be brought out. So, so the process of Krishna consciousness, of preaching Krishna consciousness, is sort of an awakening. It's awakening that dormant or sleeping Krishna consciousness that's within every conditioned soul. It's a very important point. So yeah, Prabhupada and even the devotees, I think, were very amazed when, when, when uh, that question was asked, how many disciples do you have? And he said, everyone. It's unlimited. Uh, everyone is my disciple. He said unlimited. But I think that's the meaning of it. At least from my understanding, that's the meaning of it. That everyone is Krishna conscious. So everyone is kind of a disciple in that sense. Yes? Krishna just had a comment about the Bhakti Shastri. Mm -hmm. In the um, course that Madhavendra is doing in Radhadesh, um, previously it was a prerequisite for the students to do the Bhakti Shastri exam. Uh, but now the um, Wales University of Chester that they study through, it accepts the Bhakti Shastri as uh, credits to the degree. Well, that's good. That's an indication that the Bhakti Shastri is becoming standardized, because if, up till this time, at least, there has been no, no known standardization throughout the world of Bhakti Shastri exams, but maybe through Lanto University, it's going to become standardized. Somehow it has to become standardized, yes? Um. So uh, 
the question was how do we, if Prabhupada is not here physically, how do we know if we're going off track with Yukta Vairavya and other things? It's a very, very good question. There's a, there's a Sanskrit word called sadachar. And achar, I think, means behavior, and sadachar means good or auspicious behavior, which means basically following the four regulated principles. But there's another form of sadachar that I, I read about, where devotees get together and they discuss what is going off track and what is not going off track. Is it off track to go to films and to theater if it's about Krishna? Is it off track always, or is it sometimes off track and sometimes not off track? So this is something that devotees have to discuss. What is proper behavior and what is not proper behavior. And some people say, I think sociologists say that time, place, and circumstance are the, are the uh, factors that, that are, are most important. And others say they're not, not so important because it's a form of compromise, adapting to time, place, and circumstance. But now we do it, it automatically. We have other instruments. There's a Dijemi or something like that in this temple there was. And, uh, Sometimes it's necessary, and on Hari Nam now they're playing accordions very commonly, which which in Prabhupada's time were never used. But uh, I would think I don't know I'm not uh, privy to these Sadachar conference uh, conferences, but I think that that's been accepted. But again, you know the best thing that I know is to is to is to uh, take advice from senior devotees to find out what is proper behavior and what is not proper. Because, as you say, we do have to adjust to, to modern day circumstances. Yes. Thank you, Shem. So, any other uh, comments or <laughs> questions? I don't, I don't know if I can answer them all. Yes. <coughs> Marish, uh, there was some, some complaint in, in Prabhupada's time that the mode is doing book distribution. Um, no, we're disturbing people, you know, in their life, in their free will. Life. The prophet made some point that, well, you know, people are they're disturbed by so many things already in the material world, and, and this, you no, know, you no, know, intervening in, in their life, it's for their eternal benefit. So even if they feel somewhat disturbed, they're getting immense, immense benefits. So we should stop just because maybe they they're not happy that we're approaching them, that we're preaching to them. Um, we should stop preaching because then you know, we're giving them the greatest, um, the greatest gift, even though they don't realize, they don't realize it. Mm. Yeah, Rupa Raghunath, I'm, I'm just repeating what he said for this people who are listening in different places in other countries, was saying that uh, there, a controversy arose <clears throat> where some people were saying that we shouldn't get in, into people's space and interfere with their, their personal lives by, by preaching because they didn't want to hear it. And uh, and, he, and Rupa Raghav was saying that the Prabhupada countered that by saying that there, people are already being disturbed by so many things, they don't realize it, and that we have to continue, and that preaching is not, a, not really, a, it, it is a disturbance in a way, but it's not really a disturbance because it's going to save them, it's going to, it's going to benefit them. And I, I think that uh, the Prabhupada in, in many ways defended the devotees and defended the, the concept of preaching by saying that, that we, it's necessary actually to, Christian consciousness is in every person, it's necessary to awaken that consciousness, therefore it's consciousness, therefore it's necessary to approach everyone and, and uh, anyone with Christian consciousness, even if they, they feel inconvenienced by it, because, because there's a Christian conscious spark in every person, it just has to be awakened. Sometimes people we find, many, most people are so covered over that just trying to give them a book is not, is, you know, they just refuse to listen. But again, uh, the idea of preaching in, in, in direct ways or, or very subtle ways is very important because, because otherwise it, Christian consciousness is not going to expand. It's just going to disappear with a few people living in the temple and it's never going to grow. But Christian consciousness is growing up. Where, where I come from in America, I, I see that, uh, that uh, most of the people, I don't know if it's, if it's a phenomenon here, but most of the initiated devotees don't actually live in the temples or temple compounds. They live outside the temples. And I think it's, it's true here in Australia too that most of the initiated devotees don't live in temples. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, it's, it's a trend anyway. It's, it's growing. So, um, you know, in a, but in, a, in another sense, the temples are the, are the, the, the center or the bowl or the basis of, of, because that's where the installed deities are located. The basis of Christian consciousness. 
So that they're very important. It's very important to come to the temples, to attend the temples, even if we don't live in the temples or the temple grounds. It's, it's very important to, to know what those are and, and to, to uh, frequent them as much as possible. That makes sense? Uh, what separates Krishna consciousness in, in a lot of ways from other uh, so-called Vaishnava groups is that, that uh, there's a, a high value placed on, on preaching. And even if it's just a little bit of preaching, if, it, if it's people coming to a restaurant for the first time or for many years, you know, that's, or someone becoming a vegetarian, that's a little step in the right direction. And that, that enlivens devotees. It doesn't necessarily enlighten other people, but it enlivens devotees because because it's, it's a form of outreach, it's a, it's a way of, of speaking to others. In, in some interfaith meetings, I, I remember sitting at a table with people that were actually eating meat, because they were serving a kind of a lunch or something like that. So, so even, even wandering into very un unpleasant circumstances is sometimes part of the, the preaching effort. Uh, there was a time when, I think it was Brahmananda and Gargamuni were were negotiating for a new building in a temple in New York. This was in 1966 or 67. And uh, they had to go out to a restaurant to eat with the, the owner of this building. And they were very concerned because they couldn't make a proper offering in a restaurant. And so Prabhupada said, well, you know, you have to go to meet this man. You have to go and you can, you can offer the food, vegetarian food, of course, in your mind to Krishna. So that was a concession that, that uh, Prabhupada was making for that particular instance. At the same time, strictness is, 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 is very critically important, I would, think, I would say. So any other comments or? I think uh, we're over, over time. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. 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 Jai.